when it comes to IAS 12, that is income tax, this is one of the fundamental standards you must understand as a financial reporting student, because whether I like it or not, there is something that will come in the exam or relating to IAS 12, whether I like it or not. If you are doing corporate reporting, IAS 12 is also crucial for you because you will need IAS 12 to be able to do some other standards like IFRS 2 share based payments. So it is important you understand the way these standards are netted together generally. Now, the fair tax. The fair tax is simply the determination of the future tax consequences of a transaction. Okay, so if we have an asset, we've bought an asset, what is the tax consequences of it in the future? That is the idea about deferred tax. Now, usually, deferred tax has to do with the difference between how the entity is carrying a transaction, so the carrying amount of a transaction, and the tax base of a transaction. Now, as you know already, oh, okay, yeah, as you know already, the tax base is simply the amount attributable to an item for tax purposes. Okay, amount attributable to an item to an item for tax purposes. Amount attributable to an item for tax purposes. Amounts attributable to an item for tax purposes. In other words, how the item is kept in the books of the Ghana Revenue Authority, okay, in the books of the tax authority. In the books of the tax authority. So how does the tax authority see this transaction? How much are they carrying this transaction at? That is the idea about the tax base. The carrying amount, on the other hand, is how the transaction is being carried in the books of the entity. Okay, how the transaction is being carried in the books of the entity. So comparing the two is going to give us the deferred tax. But before we get to the deferred tax, this is what happens. We're first going to get what we call the temporary difference. The temporary difference is simply the difference between the carrying amount of the item in question and the tax base of the item. That is what we call the temporary difference, TD. The temporary difference. So how we are carrying the item in our books as compared to how the tax authority sees that same item, it's giving us what we call the temporary difference. One thing that you must understand very important is that temporary difference can either be taxable or deductible. So we have taxable temporary difference and then deductible temporary difference. When we say temporary difference is taxable, what it simply means is that the carrying amount of the item is greater than the tax base. In other words, the entity is carrying the item at a figure higher than how the tax authority sees the same item. What does that mean generally? It means that taxable temporary difference results into what we call deferred tax liability okay it results into a deferred tax liability now deductible temporary difference means deductible temporary difference it means that here the tax authority is carrying the item item at a higher figure than the entity is carrying in its books so here our carrying value is less than the tax base hence it results into what we call a deferred tax asset which is usually a position an entity would want to be at always. I mean, having a deferred tax asset so that we can write it off against the profits of the company for the period under review. So the, def the temporary difference can be taxable. It can be deductible generally at the end of the day. Usually, if it is taxable, it means that it's a positive figure coming in. If it is deductible, then it's a negative figure coming in at the end of the day. Now, what does this mean in reality when we look at this? So let me give you an example here. So let's say that an entity buys an asset, okay? So an entity buys an asset. Let, let's give an example here. So an entity buy an asset at a cost of whatever, let's say $10,000, and they have decided to depreciate the asset over the useful life of the asset so economic useful life is 10 years now 
for tax purposes, the tax authority can grant capital allowance at maybe 25% reducing balance. You know, the idea about fixed assets generally is that whilst the entity is depreciating, the tax authority does not know depreciation. The tax authority disallows depreciation, but rather gives capital allowance. So the entity will be charging depreciation as per IAS 16, property, plant, and equipment. Okay, property, plant, and equipment. But the tax authority will be looking at that same item from the perspective of the tax laws. And the tax laws doesn't have depreciation. What a tax law gives or provides is capital allowance. So if this is what we have, remember our concept here. We said we're going to be comparing the current amount of the item to the tax base of the item. item that is the amount attributable to the item for tax purposes. So coming in from that angle, I'm going to work for two years so that we can also work for movement in deferred tax and see how it is going to be accounted for generally. So let's say we bring in the cost of the assets. And in the context of our example, it's 10 years. Then we're going to bring in depreciation for year one. So that's 10,000 over 10 years. So that's going to be 1,000. So we get a carrying amount or the carrying value at the end of year one, and that's $9,000. Let's do one more because I need two years to be able to illustrate deferred tax well. In year two, we'll charge the same depreciation of 1000 because depreciation is on a straight line basis. So the carrying amount at the end of year two is now 8000 so this is the current amount applying IAS 16, property, plants, and equipment. But immediately in a question, you see that there is capital allowance issues coming in. It means we cannot end here. It means there is a tax implication on the transaction that we have to take into consideration and pay attention to generally at the end of the day. So let's calculate the tax base of the asset. In other words, how the tax authority will see the same item year on year. So we bring the cost of the asset, still $10,000, but this time around, we will less capital allowance because the tax authority doesn't know depreciation. So the capital allowance, it's 25%, reducing balance basis, and that's 2,500. So the tax base at the end of year one, it's going to be 7,500. All right. Then we go to the capital allowance for year two. Go to capital allowance for year two. And reducing balance basis. So we'll take 25% on the 7,500. Let's see how much we have. I see some of you guys joining. You are welcome. Give us a thumbs up on the video if you're getting some value. Share with others as well. Let's reach as many students as possible. But most importantly, let me hear from you in the comment section. Any questions you have for me? Something you want me to share my thought on here. So our tax base in year two, it's now going to be 5625. All right. 5625. So this is the carrying amount. This is the tax base. So we're going to now put our schedule up like this. So I'm going to have the carrying amount here. I'll have the tax base here. I'll have the temporary difference here. And then I'll have the deferred tax here. All right. Have the deferred tax here in the last column. Now, there is something I didn't give in the question and in my illustration, MB. Let's take the tax rate to be what? 20%. You see, the tax rate is 20%. So let's see what we got. So in the year one, we have two years coming up. What are the carrying amounts respectively as we worked out? 9,000 and 8,000. And then 8,000. 
for the tax base from our working stew, we got 7,500. And then what else we got? 5,625. So the difference between the two gives us the temporary difference. So that's going to be 1,005 here. You can see it's positive. That means it is a taxable temporary difference. And then the second one, 8,000 minus 5,625. That is 2375. Also a taxable temporary difference. So to get my deferred tax, the deferred tax is going to be the temporary difference multiplied by the tax rate. Okay. The deferred tax is the temporary difference multiplied by the tax rate. In this case, our tax rate is 20% from the illustration that we brought up. So 1,500 times 0.2. It's 300 here. And then we're going to be having the second one, 2375 times 0 0.2. That's 475. So this is the idea about the deferred tax. But how do we express this in the financial statements? So in the financial statement, let's say the statement of financial or statement of profit or loss. Just an extract. So in the statement of profit or loss, we're going to have, uh, let's present it in a columnar form. That means year one and then year two, slash in our currency sign. We're going to bring in the depreciation for every year from the workings one. That's 1,000 each year. Then we're going to have the deferred tax coming in. Please stay with me carefully. That's from Workings 2. The deferred tax is coming in from Workings 3. Now, the first year is 300. You bring that up. But in subsequent year, we don't bring the 475 in the PL account. We rather deal with movement in deferred tax. So in subsequent years, it is movement in deferred tax that will go to the PL account. Note also that there are some times where Movement in deferred tax will go to the OCI. That is, if the deferred tax is arising as a result of revaluation of assets, then the deferred tax may be recognized in the other comprehensive income. But if the question is quiet, then our deferred tax will definitely be recognized in the PL account. So, in the second year, we're going to look for movement in deferred tax, meaning the difference between the opening and the closing. So for year two, what is going to the PL account? So balance brought forward will be the 300. Balance brought down will be the 475. So if you check it up, there is a movement of an increment of 175. That 175 is what will go to the PL account for year two. The movement. So on subsequent year, it's the movement in deferred tax that will go to the PL accounts. Like I said, that movement in deferred tax, if assuming it came as a result of revaluation of assets, a portion of that will go to OCI, other comprehensive income, then the rest will go to the PL account. And that is, we will look at something like that maybe later on when we look at a couple of questions. Then certainly in the statement of financial position, also in a columnar form, year one. And year two, we slash in the currency sign coming in. We have the non-current assets. Then we're going to have the assets that we bought from Workings 1. 9,000 here, 8,000 here, as they are carrying amount respectively. Then under liability, deferred tax is a non-current liability item. So we bring in the closing balances. It is the closing balance that comes to the statement of financial position. Year one is 300. And then year two is 475. So you realize that in the year two, in the statement of financial position, yes, the closing balance will be brought, 475. But what comes to the PL will only be the movement between the what was at the beginning of the year and what we calculated at the reporting date. And that is the idea about you know deferred tax. Like I said, it has other implications. What I just look out for here is one. It has other implications in relation to revaluation of assets. 
Okay, like I said, if you revalue assets and there is deferred tax, it's likely that the deferred tax will be splitted between OCI and PL. The amount that goes to the OCI should be equivalent to the revaluation surplus uh, there based on the tax rate. Then deferred tax can also arise as a result of even investment in associates. Or let me put it investment in general. Then deferred tax can also arise when we are dealing with share based payments. And that is IFRS, you know, two and other issues in that case. But generally, what we are doing is we are comparing how the entity is carrying the I terminate books and then the tax base on it for tax purposes. That is the idea about deferred tax. 